In terms of the Northwest Territories and the development of Aboriginal groups and, and, and their cause, we always had to have a certain amount of humor and uh, from the northern Arctic perspective we approach things differently but oftentimes we'd have people come in from the uh, southern Canada to be involved in helping us getting, getting politically motivated. So uh, we've had all kinds of people very strong and particularly Indian groups from BC and there was once this girl in came to my place and stayed with me for quite some time. And my mother is totally non-political and uh, a very much a survivor. And she was sitting, I went to bed and she was sitting um, and not many other people to talk to. So Rosalie had said, well, Maggie, you know, you're a native person. Your daughter is totally involved. You must feel very strong about your identity in the mosaic of the developing political situation in the Northwest Territories. And this went on for quite a while, so finally, um, my mother says, what? And he says, well, how do you feel about yourself in all this? And my mother says, well, my name is Maggie Batham, and I'm very happy to be alive. Presently, my job uh, here is ch the chair and the chief executive officer of the Inuyang Regional Corporation. And uh, this is the overall um, corporation and all the other corporations, such as the Development Corporation, the Investment Corporation, and any of the other subsidiaries are uh, contained under the Inuyang Regional Corporation. Uh, head. You know. So the Inuvial Regional Corporation heads up all the corporate groups that are Inuvial. My home really is uh, a clavic and, and uh, the um, most of my younger life I was brought up about 30 miles below a clavic and, uh, and grew up in that area between a clavic and um, and uh, the West Channel, mm -hmm. so that's what it was called. And um, in those days, everybody was a hunter and a trapper, so mm -hmm. my father was a hunter and trapper, and we were just part of a broader community, mm -hmm. so everybody did the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
so um, that's where I, I spent most of my life. I was fortunate uh, uh, maybe being a girl and second in the family and uh, where it's, it was felt I was needed more at home so I had more of an opportunity to do my education and, and take my education through correspondence courses rather than going to a hostel mm -hmm. and uh, that helped a lot in terms of you know having really strong ties to the family and mm -hmm. to the region. In the early uh, 60s, you know, there was a chain of events where uh, more people began to move in. Uh, this Inuvik was becoming a, a, a larger center where other people's interest um, seemed to be taken over from what was known as the community of, of the Delta. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that was lived with for a while, but when the oil and gas industry came in, it sort of shot out into the Delta because most of the work was going, being done out there. And I'd been working, you know, most of my life with hunters and trappers committees and, and community committees as secretary of letting, letter writing and, and these types of things. And, and it got to a point where um, it was very difficult to get the respect of the, um, of the industry and of government when people had something to say. And because I guess we were not a political force to be reckoned with. And um, because um, Agnes Summer was a key person, you know, she generally um, led the way and, and tried to figure out things, you know, what is the best way to go? How do uh, the people get a voice? And um, so with her connections and with her discussions, uh, she felt that you had to become a, a, legit, a legitimate incorporated body with a mandate, you know, with the guidelines and the membership behind you. So that's how COPE was formed because people just were not uh, taking the Inuvialuit or even the, the uh, Gwich'in who were around here very seriously. set of Canada decided that it was too broad an area so they they formed a, a broader organization known as Inuit Barrack Set of Canada. Mm -hmm. So these things you know happened. We started with everybody involved and then gradually uh, I guess there's there was funding available to uh, the other organization. It was very difficult for Agnes to secure support uh, government funding, lobby support for, for uh, COPE. Mm -hmm. And uh, because at the beginning she didn't want that. She felt that people had to be committed to the organization, had to really believe in what they were doing or else it wouldn't survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first um, a really clash or conflict we had with oil and gas was within Banks Island and some of the, the work that was done at Crosley Lake where there was dynamite blasting in the lakes. People were very concerned about that and so those were the you know, in the early stages of the organization right at the beginning of 1970. And, uh, and it was difficult to hold things together because there was always people didn't weren't, weren't experienced in an adversarial organization. You know most in the out like to be nice about things and 
and it was difficult for them to get aggressive and mm -hmm. um, it was nice that Agnes was around because she didn't have a problem with that you know and uh, many of us were recruited to to do the the background work and uh, and she didn't have any fear of facing uh, some pretty tough uh, and well uh, funded mm -hmm. industry organizations and um, and even some of the uh, the uh, the um, councils you know the community councils like the town of Inuvik was very concerned that we would drive away the industry and that uh, you know nothing you know will happen and so we didn't have a lot of friends, you know, as COPE, you know, other than the really strong Inuvialu that were backing it. Mm -hmm. And look, we're looking more in the future. Mm -hmm. I was involved with, with uh, COPE and uh, then ITC. And then when we broke away in 1974, I was involved with COPE and, and the negotiation of the claim. I was heavily involved with the community part of it, the community. Uh, the communications in the community, dealing with the community, deal with individual families, mm -hmm. information, and uh, community support. So I was always involved with that, you know, when we went on with our claim. Mm -hmm. So in 19, we, we, we had a lot of problems. We had uh, the government of the Yukon was against us because they didn't want us to have had any part of a claim in the Yukon. Um, the, the um, Indian groups in the Northwest Territories were concerned with, with what we were doing because they didn't want us to set a precedent. Mm -hmm. And the, even within Utah Parasite, we had difficulty with them, you know, with a number of people uh, who felt that, you know, when they withdrew the claim, because we were all together at one time, all the Inuit were together, but they weren't prepared because the communities weren't enough informed. But we were facing the development. We were facing the, the you know, you know, major upheaval here. And if you leave it too, left it too long, then you know, just by not doing anything about it, you don't have a place. Eh? Mm -hmm. And people were pushed further back in the background. So I was always involved with it, you know, right from the beginning, and uh, the concern of of, of having in reality you know, have a say in, in, the, in their land base and in their homeland. And um, when I went, uh, when I was working with Co with COPE and um, the, to we always had difficulty with the Northwest Territorial Government. Um, they weren't hard and fast on anything, but what it was is they always was throwing roadblocks in, you know, creating issues that we had to solve. And it took a long time. It slowed down the process of claims. And, and uh, although they weren't part of the negotiations, they were part of the federal government team. And so they'd always throw roadblocks in the way. And it was decided that someone had to be in the territorial government that understood the claim and to make sure that, that the issue of the Northwest Territories uh, government um, was taken care of. So that's why I ran in the election in 1979. It's just for that specific purpose because we we seemed to be stymied by the NWT government. We couldn't understand why. Uh, it just seemed that there was a, a group of people that didn't want the claim to go forward. So let's keep putting stumbling blocks and just delay and delay. Day, and maybe they'll get tired and give up or run out of money or their, pe their own people will turn against them because then they're spending too much money. So all these str kinds of things were happening. So that's why I, I didn't really have a great desire to run for territorial council. It was the fact that there was a number of us who could have and, uh, and so we sat together and, and because my children had grown up and were on their own, it just, I was the one that probably had the best ability to, and the freedom to, to take on that task.
I guess the readiness, if you want to know, or the, or the learning or the knowledge came way be back before government. You know, we, I've always, from the time I was a kid, always involved with community activities and always involved with people um, and, um, and uh, the different organizations that were formed, whether they were community or otherwise. And I've always been interested in, you know, how things work generally. You know, I, you know, we're not just a little, you know, I, my father was very good at, about this and talking to everybody in the West Channel. I know we, Victor Allen and Edward and all these sometimes used to listen to him and say, what are you talking about? Because we always thought that everything should stay the same. We'll still be standing here on the bank. We'll still be off picking off muskrats. You know, we'll still be skinning muskrats and the economy could still survive and we'll still have a good life. But he used to always talk about us not, you know, putting our head in the ground and, and thinking that we're only going to be ourselves. And, you know, but just through the discussions and, 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 and pushing, you know, our, ourselves to think beyond and saying that we're just a small part of a very large society. So even though you ran your life perfectly where you are, you did the best, you're going, the influence from other places are going to slowly overtake you and you have to be ready for that. And you can't put your head in the sand anymore. And we used to wonder, what, what are you talking about, you know? And, but as things evolved, you could see these changes coming in. And you could see at one time you were a very important group of people. And then all of a sudden someone else is more important and someone else it's later on, you're just a nuisance, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I guess I've always been involved, so whether I was involved with COPE or IRC and government, you learn a lot. In government, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about, you know, how to do things, how to get things done, you know, where the connections are in government, mm -hmm. um, who does what, you know, and how governments change, you know? and the limitations on government too. So that knowledge is always good, whether I was working here or working in the community, that knowledge is very good. The mandate of IRC is, is contained in the final agreement. And, uh, and one of the, the one main parts of it is, is to, to allow Inuvial to be meaningful participants in a changing northern and canadian society that means a lot mm -hmm. you know we have to to uh, get politically or otherwise um avenues for every individuality to try to be a meaningful partner or participant in the society you know uh, right now when we're discussing that issue we ask ourselves this question what is basically the problem that is limiting that to happen, okay? Mm -hmm. What is limiting? And some of, the, some of the problems is economics, jobs, and when you talk about that, it's lack of education. It comes out more and more, the lack of edu academic education. People have different kinds of education, but academic education is very important in this day and age. You know, even if you're a trapper, it would be important for you to have a fairly decent academic education just because of how you would do your work differently. And people having children, if they wanted to educate their children out, if they decide to have a land base, you want to educate, you educate your children. It's possible to educate your children on the land.
there's three components. Um, and it took us a long time after getting a lot of this work done to settle on, on uh, the principles, eh? What <coughs> does it mean? And the basic principles, I'm going to read it to you. Probably some of you know it all by heart. To preserve a Nubial cultural identity and values within a changing northern society. So we knew it was changing. But at the same time, you know, we had to preserve who we are and try to make sure that the values were there. And we still have to work very hard to do that. Uh, B, to enable Inuvial to be equal and meaningful participants in the northern and national economy and society. Now, the word equal and meaningful probably took us the longest time to get government to agree to those two words. They want to water those words down and tell us, you know, you don't really need those words. So we spent a lot of time, one of them is meaningful, you know, and they wanted the smaller, less pressing words. And then to protect and preserve the Arctic wildlife environment and biological productivity. So those were the three principles that guide all these, and that every one of these were developed and taken door to door. <laughs> not only the offshore development of oil and gas, uh, but also, you know, the whole opening up of the Arctic. Nellie Cornier says the road does more than link two isolated communities. This uh, attention to a access to the coast and a recognition that there's a coast that will bring more stability in the long term. Lately, the region has been starved for jobs. Some residents say they're concerned the highway will pass too closely by Husky Lakes and it'll bring too much traffic to the sensitive area around their traditional camp. But few are speaking publicly about that. 200 people now have jobs with the project and leaders hope that's just the start. The oil and gas, you know, that's what we see in the long term with the offshore happening. I, I really strongly believe that can survive on tourism alone. The Arctic Ocean is right here, top of the Acta, right on the Arctic Ocean. It, it'll sell itself right there. Gruben Cornier and others crusaded for the highway. They lobbied the federal government after becoming frustrated when the territorial government promised a road but never came up with any money. They didn't do anything about it, it was just a lot of talk. Now with the federal government paying two-thirds, the territorial government is kicking in at least $100 million. It'll pick up any cost overruns and pay for maintenance. Cornier says in exchange for agreeing to help pay for the road, Ottawa increased the territory's boring limit. If it wasn't for this project being on the table and, and their appeal to the government that they did not have money to do their share, the debt wall wouldn't have been lifted. She says other regions could learn a thing or two from the Inuvialuit. If people want to get money for their projects, then go ahead and start doing the work like we did.
Today is the official opening of the floor, named after Nellie Cornway, who's been a you know a leader in the field in uh, the Western High Arctic in the Inuvialuit region in particular. We're very proud of the fact that we work very closely with the Inuvialuit and have for many years now in this two ways of understanding how this system is functioning. Our objective really is to understand that system with the tools of Western science and to understand what they are right now and what are the pressures on that system. What are the pressures that are causing it to change? How fast are those things changing? And importantly, can we model those changes? Can we make a really good model of what the Arctic marine system will look like 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, based on a firm understanding of the science that we're doing today. The science that is coming out of this will be something that we will be proud of for decades to come, and uh, it's something that will be an ongoing legacy of the University of Manitoba. So this institute and this floor and our focus on the Arctic will be something that will be uh, at the University of Manitoba in perpetuity now. If you don't survive and you don't get on with your life and you don't feel good about yourself and you don't feel like you, you're competitive you're with other people, you don't feel so good about yourself. So that's a different way of dying. So we have to get on in, in trying to you know, work with the education department, with government and everyone, trying to get people academically operational so that they don't feel that they can compete if they want to compete. Oh!